Hey everyone, welcome to Great Lakes Church. My name is Carson, and I gotta tell you before we get into our weekly message that we're a community of people helping people find and follow Jesus. We're based out of Southeast Wisconsin. We have physical locations in Kenosha, Racine, but if you're listening to this or watching this, you've found our online presence. We share content on our YouTube and our podcast platforms wherever you listen, and we love that you're a part. If you want to know more about what's going on here at Great Lakes Church, you can find out more at greatlakeschurch.com or check out our central hub. But until then, everything you need is going to be in the description, so enjoy the message, and we'll catch you next time. Hello. Well, last week we kicked off a teaching series that we're going to be in for several weeks called Foolproofing Your Life. Foolproofing Your Life. And throughout the series, what we're doing is we're looking at various sayings written by King Solomon three years ago in his book called Proverbs. Now, you probably already know this, that Proverbs are just brief statements about how life works, right? They're, they're brief statements that express some sort of truth. So many hands make light work. Yeah, that would be a proverb. Or an apple a day keeps the doctor away. That would be a proverb. Short phrases about how life generally works. In other words, most of the time, if you do this, here's the result you can expect. Not all the time, but most of the time. And the thing about Proverbs that ought to encourage all of us is it doesn't matter where you're at in your faith. It doesn't matter what your race is, your gender is. It doesn't matter what your background is. If you choose to apply a proverb, most likely it's going to work especially the ones written by King Solomon because they're jam-packed with wisdom. And the reason that we're doing this series and the reason we're spending several weeks uh, talking about wisdom is we are living at a time period in history where we have pretty much unlimited access to knowledge and information. But it's becoming an increasing challenge to know how to apply knowledge and information in a responsible way. Right? So this is why we need wisdom. Several years ago, there is a really, really smart guy by the name of Scott Bertosowitz. He's stuck in traffic on Interstate 696 in Detroit. His frustration is growing, so he decides to tweet about it. Here is the tweet he put out. He says, I find it ironic that Detroit is known as the hashtag Motor City, and yet no one here knows how to freaking drive. (laughs) Now, I edited this word here because it actually wasn't freaking. It was more dramatic than that, but because my parents attend Great Lakes Church, I decided to edit it. So he just puts this out there. And of course, you know this, that in most cases, that really wouldn't be that big of a deal. The problem was Scott was working for a firm that controlled the social media and marketing accounts for Chrysler Automotive. (laughs) And Scott accidentally sent this tweet from the Chrysler account instead of his personal one. So it's not gonna surprise you, Scott ends up losing his job, but here's the deal. In addition to losing his job, the company that Scott worked for they lost their account with Chrysler, which had 20 different employees assigned to it. Just because you're smart, just because you know a lot of stuff doesn't mean you're wise. And of course, in Scott's situation, we could kind of dismiss it. We could say, well, that was an accident, right? That was totally unintentional. But we talked about this last week, that a wise person understands all of life is connected. So we can dismiss it and say, well, that has nothing to do with wisdom, right? That, again, totally unintentional. But a wise person understands that what I say or what I do or what I post, even if it's on a personal or a private account, it's connected to every area of my life at some level. So it doesn't matter whether it's a personal account or a corporate account, it matters. And this is why we need wisdom. Life is like one big connect the dots page, right? We've all seen connect the dots and uh, we've kind of, kind of drawn and tried to figure out what certain things look like. Guys, every decision we make, Every choice that we activate in our life is somehow another dot, and it's connected to another dot, which is connected to another dot, right? The choices we make in the past, they're connected to our present, and the choices we're making in the present, they're connected to the future. That is how life works. 3,000 years ago, King Solomon of Israel writes about wisdom and personifies wisdom as a woman. And here's what he says about Lady Wisdom. He says, if you prize wisdom, she will make you great. Embrace her, and she will honor you. If you embrace Lady Wisdom, she will protect you from destroying your life. If you embrace Lady Wisdom, she will help you stay focused on the big picture. 
so you don't just get caught up in the moment and fixated with what's right in front of you. If you embrace Lady Wisdom, she will safeguard you from regret. So last week we talked about how whenever we are confronted with a decision or a situation or an opportunity that doesn't have a simple yes or no to it, what we need to do is we need to learn to stop and pause and ask the question, what is the wise thing to do? And our filter for that question is the past, the present, and the future. All right, so when we're confronted with a decision, with a situation or opportunity with no clear yes or no, we need to just pause and ask, in light of my past experiences, my current circumstances, my future hopes and dreams, what is the wise thing for me to do? Now, if you've been around Great Lakes for a while, you probably know this, that uh, several times a year, I travel to the state of Washington. Uh, there's a church in the Seattle area that I speak at uh, seven, eight, maybe nine times a year. And uh, it's become, in many ways, like a second family to me. But one of the things I love to do when I'm in the Seattle area and in the state of Washington, I love to go hiking. Because Washington has some of the best hiking trails in the country. So several years ago, I'm there. I decide to hike Mount Pilchuck, which is about 70 miles from Seattle. My goal was, I want to get to the top of the mountain where this lookout is, and uh, I, I just want to uh, basically hike this mountain in one day, All right? So I get to the trailhead pretty early on, and I take my time, and I'm hiking for a couple of hours. But the closer I get to the lookout, the more snow there was. And I hadn't really thought it through because this is a June day. This is the middle of summer. I started out, I'm just wearing shorts and a t-shirt. And so now I'm in a place where I see snow and I just keep hiking and things are getting slipperier and slipperier. And I had a hiking boots on, but I wasn't fully prepared for the snow. I wasn't uh, prepared with the right equipment. And so it's kind of embarrassing. I'm watching people walk by me, like it's no big deal, but they have the right equipment. So eventually I had to make the decision that since I'm not fully prepared, I'm gonna have to come back another day. I'm gonna have to pay attention to my concerns and, 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 and basically the warning signs all around me that this isn't smart. Well, 3,000 years ago, King Solomon of Israel, he writes about the importance of paying attention to the path we're on in life, and here's how he phrases it. He says, a prudent person, a wise person, right? They foresee danger and take precautions. He says, the simpleton, the naive, the unwise, they go blindly on and suffer the consequences. A prudent person, they see danger, they take precautions, they pay attention to the warning signs. The simpleton, they go blindly on and they'll suffer the consequences. And it's very interesting when we read this verse because it's pretty obvious that the prudent person and the simple person, and that's not a, 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 uh, meant to be some big insult, right? But it's, it's just meant to uh, describe someone as unwise, that the wise and the unwise they see the same things, but they respond very differently. And every one of us, if we just took the time to think and maybe pull out a notebook and start writing down stories, we have experienced personally what Solomon writes. Because all of us have multiple stories of times in life where we chose to ignore the warning signs and we chose to ignore the advice people were giving us and we chose to ignore sometimes even our gut and we suffer the consequences, financial consequences health consequences, relationship consequences, parenting consequences, reputation consequences. And what's so sad is that many of the consequences that we have suffered because of our own decisions turned into personal problems. And so many of the personal problems we go through in life can't really be fixed. Right, we can read self-help books, we can go talk to a therapist, we can learn how to navigate and, and cope. There's no doubt about it, right? God can use the problems that we brought onto ourselves through choices we made. He can use them in beneficial ways to, to do something in us and through us. I, I, I don't want to downplay that, but the reality is most of the personal problems that plague our life as a result of the choices we made, they can't really be fixed. That's the bad news. The good news is, as we look ahead, we can avoid a lot of potential future problems. And the way that we avoid a lot of the potential future problems somewhere out there in the distance is by paying attention to the path we're on and the direction we're headed. Right? This is such a simple principle. We, we revisit this principle at least once every two or three years. And the principle is this. Direction 
determines destination. That's it. Direction determines destination. So if after the service today, I decide I'm going to go buy some sunscreen and I'm going to buy uh, some, some, uh, a pair of you know, swimming suit, uh, a, a swimming suit and, and some beach towels, and I tell everybody I am going to Florida, and I get in my vehicle, and I get on I-94, and I start heading west, it doesn't matter how fast I drive, and it doesn't matter how far I drive, I'm never going to get there. It doesn't matter if I have my camera separate from my iPhone, right? It doesn't matter if I've called my friends and told them I'm gonna meet them in Florida. It doesn't matter if I've booked a hotel. It doesn't matter if I prayed for traveling mercies. If I get on I-94 and start heading west, I will eventually make it to the godforsaken land of Minnesota, but I'm not gonna make it to Florida. <laughs> now we know this when it comes to driving and we know it when it comes to hiking, but for some reason, when it comes to finances and relationships and moral standards and, uh, and, and entertainment standards and lifestyle pursuits and what we do with our free time, there's just something in us as humans. It's very, very difficult to connect the dots. But direction determines destination. Not our hopes, not our dreams, not our desires. Not our prayers, not our demographic, not our salary, not our education, not our beliefs, not our religious background. It is the path that we're on and the direction we're headed that determines where we end up. And the reason this is so important is because it means every decision we make is somehow part of that path. Ah, Dave, it's just a date. No, it's not, it's a path. Come on, it's just another purchase. No, it's not. It's a path. It's just another movie. No big deal. No, it's not. It's a path. Well, it's just another night out with friends. No, it's not. It's a path. Well, it's just another conversation. No, it's not. It's a path. And the path we take will eventually determine where we end up, which is why we need wisdom. Wisdom is both a guide and a guardrail. Now, just think about this for a little bit, right? It's a guide, it's like a map. It's like a GPS on our phone. Wisdom helps us navigate difficult dif uh, uh, situations. It helps us make decisions that can lead us in the direction we wanna go. That's what wisdom does. But it's also a guardrail, right? We've seen guardrails in many arenas of life. What do they do? They keep us a safe distance from danger. They keep us from going over some sort of cliff. And I don't care how much you love Jesus, I don't care how old you are, I don't care what your background is. Every single one of us need guardrails in our life. Financial guardrails, moral guardrails, ethical guardrails, relational guardrails. And we need guardrails so that we are kept safe, right? So that we're protected mentally and emotionally and physically and relationally. And I don't need a ton of examples to give you, right? I was starting to think this week, like, what are some examples I could just throw in? Here's, here's what I know. Our greatest regrets in life are often preceded by a series of unwise decisions. Not immoral decisions, not unethical decisions, not illegal decisions, just unwise decisions. And the series of unwise decisions that we made at the time, they had virtually no consequence at the time. So we didn't think much about them. But eventually those decisions led us to a place of deep regret. And the impact of that regret has the potential to follow us for the rest of our life. And so the role of wisdom, what wisdom is supposed to do, is to keep us at a safe distance from regret. It is a guide and a guardrail. And so what I want to do with the rest of the time we have today is I want to talk about how this applies to every single one of us, but specifically as it's related to, us, uh, to the word success. And the reason I want to talk about success is because every one of us, if we're just being honest, like we want to be successful at some level in the different arenas of our life. Right? And if you say, well, I really don't really care about being successful, well, then you're devaluing it. You ought to want to be successful. But here's the deal. If we're not paying attention to the path we're on, we're going to spend our lives chasing and pursuing and walking towards and going after something we think is success only to discover it's a mirage. And we'll spend crazy amounts of time and crazy amounts of energy and crazy amounts of money pursuing something that at some point we start to realize, oh, wow, this doesn't even exist. And if we end up going down the wrong path long enough, what we'll discover is we have wasted months of our life, 
years of our life, and in some cases, decades of our life that we cannot get back. And it's going to bring us a whole lot of heartache and a whole lot of frustration. And we see this frustration expressed in some of the classic songs over the years, right? Rolling Stones, I can't get no satisfaction. You too, I still haven't found what I'm looking for. Notorious B-I-G, no, mo money, mo problems. Right, so the question I want us to consider is how do we know if the path we're on is leading us to real success? Well, the starting point for real success is just knowing what it looks like. I mean, it's pretty that much that's that, that basic, right? We got to know what it looks like. And if we don't define what success looks like, we'll just spend our entire life chasing it. Now, this doesn't mean we have to have some crystal clear, uh, picture perfect, uh, you know, no, no blurriness to it uh, type of uh, clarity in our mind. But it does mean we have to have an idea of what true success looks like so that we know whether or not we're walking in the right direction. Right? Some of the earliest explorers, uh, they didn't know exactly what they were looking for, but they knew how to navigate the direction. They had an idea of, hey, we're looking for land or whatever, and they're, they're looking for landmarks, and they're paying attention to where the sun is, and they're studying the stars. We need to have at least some idea of what real success looks like so that we can be moving in that direction. And if we were to just pass the mic around today and everybody was to talk about, hey, what do you think success is? It's going to be all over the map, right? Some people, they think of su success as influence, right? If, if I can get people, if I can influence people to buy something, if I can get a lot of followers, if I can sway the opinions of people, that, that is success. Others would argue, well, it's approval. Get mom's approval, dad's approval, get the approval of people in my life. Some would say, well, it's just happiness. As long as I'm happy, I'm successful. Others would say, well, it's freedom and autonomy. I do whatever I want, whenever I want. I, I don't have a lot of restrictions. Others would say it's just being respected. Some would say it's financial independence, right? Others would say it's, it's an impact. I, I leave a legacy, and at my funeral, people say a lot of great things about me. So it's all over the map. So my question to you is, have you in your mind, in your heart, defined what real success looks like in the most important areas of your life? It doesn't have to be necessarily written down, but it should be in your mind, it should be in your heart. Have you defined what real success looks like relationally, financially, in your marriage, in your family, in parenting? What does it look like to be a success in your career, in your, in your profession? If we don't know what success looks like, if we don't define it, we're just going to wander through life aimlessly, taking whatever pass in front of us at the moment, or we'll end up adopting someone else's definition of success. And that's what is probably the most common for us, is we just take someone else's idea and what's presented in some sort of marketing or uh, some sort of advertisement. It's like, yeah, that, that's what success looks like. So the more clear we are about what success looks like, the easier it is for us to evaluate the path we're on. So if you're married, how do you define success? And I hope it's more inspirational than to not get divorced, right? I, I, I've heard many definitions over the years. Uh, one person says that I define success for marriage as to always want to be where the other person is. I love that, right? Someone else, to remain best friends in every season of life. Another person says, to always make the other person feel like they are the most important person in the relationship. I love that. When it comes to finances, how do you define success? Well, that at least every month on time, I pay the minimum payment on my credit card. Right? What does it look like for you? You might say, well, financial success is to live with margin and avoid unnecessary money-related stress. Or maybe for you, it's to ensure that your money is always serving you rather than you serving your money. Or maybe it's to grow in your generosity every single year. If you're a parent, how do you define success? Well, I want good kids. Yeah, we all want good kids. We want smart kids and educated kids and well-behaved kids. That's great. But what if they're smart and educated and really good kids, but they never want to be around each other? When you know what the North Star is, it impacts your decisions and it impacts the direction you're heading. And the reason this is so important is because most of the time, if we're making unwise decisions and going down the wrong path, we won't even notice until we're really far down that path. And the parenting decisions that many of us made 
or the financial decisions that we made in our 20s or our 30s, man, we really didn't notice the impact of it until later on, for the good or bad, right? Or the, or the little bit of flirting or messaging that we're doing with someone that we're not married to, it doesn't seem like that big of a deal. There's nothing illegal about it. Some would argue there's nothing unethical about it. I'm just having a little bit of fun. But then our heart goes so far down the wrong path that it's hard to rein it back. So it's important to know where we're headed in life and what success looks like. And inevitably, we're all going to define it a little bit differently. But as you try to define it for yourself, let me at least give you some marks you should be looking for. I just want to give you three marks of success. Here we go. The first one is this. It's lasting. Okay, so real success is built on a solid foundation and it allows you to go the distance. What do you mean it's lasting? Well, if you win the Tour de France seven consecutive times, but it's discovered that you've been using performance enhancing drugs, it's not real success. If you sell 75 million albums, but you're sentenced to prison for 30 years for inappropriate relationships with minors, it's not real success. If you're a top news anchor and you're highly respected in your field, but you're dismissed for making false claims or lying about certain events, that's not real success. If you've got a great job and you've got a savings account that's growing every month, but your own family doesn't want to be around you, that's not real success. If you have a reputation for being a hard worker and making lots of sales, but your employees or your coworkers don't respect you, that's not real success. If you've got a ton of friends and lots of people who want to hang out with you, but there are parts of your life that you hope nobody ever discovers, and you're always trying to keep secret from everyone, you're stressing out about the fact that someone may someday find out, guys, that's not real success. King Solomon alludes to this when he writes, he says, if you fail under pressure, your strength is too small. If you fail under pressure, it's because your foundation's too weak. And often a weak foundation is the result of dishonesty or deception. Anytime we have to lie, anytime we have to cover up something, anytime that we have something in our life that we hope people do not find out, we are building our life on a weak foundation. Doesn't matter how talented you are, doesn't matter what your IQ is, doesn't matter how gifted you are, it's a weak foundation. 20 years ago when Radio Shack was kind of a healthy company for the most part, uh, Dave Edmondson, the CEO, lost his job. Now, it's a fascinating story why he lost his job, because here's the deal. He was a very successful uh, marketing executive for several years. Um, And before he became CEO, he had uh, worked at Radio Shack for a decade, held a variety of positions, proved himself. But the reason he lost his job is after he became CEO, it was discovered that when he started working for Radio Shack, he had actually lied on his resume. Now, this is fascinating to me because For over a decade, he proved himself capable. He proved himself to be a great leader. And when he lied on his resume, it's just so interesting. He didn't lie about having some MBA. He didn't lie about graduating at the top of his class from some prestigious university. He lied about having a four-year degree in theology from an unaccredited Bible college in California that nobody had ever heard of. In reality, he actually attended that Bible college but then he left to become a pastor and he didn't have a degree yet. That little lie, when it was found out, cost him his job and it put him in a position of losing stock options and a pension. Anytime you have to lie or deceive or cover something up in order to be successful, you're building on a weak foundation. That's why Solomon writes, better to have little with godliness than to be rich and dishonest. Because eventually dishonesty and deception or lack of character will catch up. We see it every single day. True success is lasting success. Another mark of real success is it's satisfying. Right, there's this sense of like, I feel good about this. I read an article uh, this past week, talks about 72% of successful entrepreneurs suffer from depression or mental health related issues. The same article talks about how CEOs typically, for the most part, suffer from depression at twice the rate of other people. And the article quoted a Harvard professor who explained it this way. They said, when people see themselves as little more than their attractive bodies, jobs, or bank accounts, it brings great suffering. You become a heartless taskmaster to yourself. So real success is satisfying. 
Real success is the people who wake up every single day and they have this attitude, I have nothing to prove and no one to impress. Now don't get me wrong, they work hard. Real successful people have a sense of purpose, right? They're always a little bit restless because they want to achieve and accomplish something else. That's great. But at the end of the day, they are at peace within themselves. So if you're constantly frustrated with your children because they're not becoming who you envision them to be, if you're always mad, got a chip on your shoulder with your coworkers because they don't work as hard as you do, if you're always unhappy about your life because it's not unfolding the way you envision it to unfold, let me just tell you, you're on the wrong path. The path you're on will not lead you to where you think it's going to go as it relates to success. Real success is satisfying. King Solomon puts it this way. He said, better a dry crust eaten in peace than a house filled with feasting and conflict. A third mark of real success is it's God honoring. Now, this is where if you are a follower of Jesus, you need to listen up. And it might sound a little bit nebulous, right? It might sound a little unclear, maybe a little bit overwhelming of like, what does that even mean? But I'm telling you, it doesn't have to be overwhelming, this idea that true success is God honoring. To honor God simply means that we're doing our best to obey God in whatever situation we find ourselves in. That when we get a sense of what God wants us to do, maybe we read something in the scripture or we heard it taught or uh, maybe it's just this prompting that we would say is the Holy Spirit uh, making us restless over something and just we feel like God is wanting me to do this. Us choosing to obey that is honoring God. Knowing what God wants us to do, that's usually not the challenge. Right, doing it is. I love this quote by Mark Twain. He says, I think all of us can relate to it. He says, most people are bothered by the passages of Scripture which they cannot understand. But as for me, I have always noticed that the passages of Scripture which trouble me most are those which I do understand. One of the things I've learned more than 25 years of being a pastor is that when people say they want advice, often what they want is confirmation of what they've already decided they're going to do. It doesn't bother me, because I think all of us are like that. Right? To some extent, we approach God that way. We want God to be some cosmic you know, consultant for us. We want him to be some genie in a bottle up in the sky. Right? We want him to be some life coach. We want God to confirm whatever decision we've already decided we're going to make so that we feel less guilty about making it. And so here's the deal. Every time that we choose to obey God and what we feel like God wants us to do, regardless of how seemingly insignificant it may be at times, we're taking steps down the right path of success. King Solomon puts it this way. He says, commit your actions to the Lord and your plans will succeed. I can't commit something to the Lord if I'm knowingly doing something in opposition to what he would ask of me. Now, just to free all of us, when it comes to making a decision in life, God's given us a free will. He's given us huge huge path that we can walk on. I mean, there's so much liberty in the path, and often we just do what we want to do based on our personality and our gift mix and our passions. Like, God gives us a wide path, but there are guardrails, right? And so the guardrails would be committing our, our, our actions to the Lord, saying, Lord, I, I want to follow you. I'm going to do my best to obey you regardless of the decisions in front of me. So regardless of this is a career-related decision, or it is a marriage-related decision, or it is a parenting-related decision, or it's a decision in what I listen to or watch, I'm gonna do my best to let my light shine through my good works so everyone can see. I'm gonna do my best in this interaction to love my neighbor as myself. I'm gonna do my best to honor others and add value to others. I'm gonna do my best to forgive as I've been forgiven. I'm gonna do my best to live open-handed. I'm gonna do my best to spend my life not just storing up treasure on earth, nothing wrong with that, right? But to also store up treasure in heaven. And so I'm gonna live within these, these boundaries, within these guardrails. Another one of his Proverbs, Solomon writes this. He says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. What does that mean? That means in whatever decision I'm trying to make, if I become aware of what God wants me to do, right? usually it's going to be through the scripture, I have to trust that my heavenly Father knows better than I do. I have to trust that God is able to see the end of the path before I do. 
I have to trust that if what God wants for me is in conflict with what I want for me, that he knows better than I do. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. He continues, and lean not on your own understanding. This doesn't minimize our own understanding, right? This doesn't minimize the knowledge we have or the life experience we have, but it's getting to the point where we say, I realize that with all of my knowledge and with all of my life experience, I don't know everything. And when my understanding of success in any arena of life, when it bumps into what God says and it stands in opposition to the teachings of Jesus or the character of God, Solomon says, a wise person allows God to trump their understanding and their reasoning. And that's going to happen from time to time. All right, Jesus says, hey, find ways to show love to the very people who hate you. He says, pray for those who hurt you. Forgive those who've wronged you. And instead of hiding your sins from others, learn to confess them. If you want to be great, you've got to choose to be a servant. Solomon says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. And then he goes, in all your ways, submit to him. In your parenting, submit to him. In your career, submit to him. In your finances, submit to him. In your relationships, in your choice of entertainment, in your marriage, in your daily decisions, in everything you do, find, have an attitude that says, I want to live in submission to you, surrender to you. And then Solomon wraps up his, his thoughts with this. And he will make your path straight. So we come to a fork in the road. We have a decision in front of us. Before we launch down the path of least resistance, before we go down the path that we're most emotionally connected to, we just need to pause. And we need to surrender our attitude and our thinking and our behavior to our Heavenly Father. And we need to consider the question in light of my past experiences and my current circumstances and my future hopes and dreams, what is the wise thing for, for me to do? And we need to live with this attitude that Heavenly Father, if there's something in my attitude, if there's something in my thinking, if there's something in my behavior that doesn't reflect you in this situation, in this decision, Please bring it to the surface because I don't want my pride. I don't want my self-importance. I don't want my stubbornness to override what you want me to do. Because ultimately, at the end of the day, real success is going to be way more about who we're becoming than what we're accomplishing. Way more about who we're becoming than what we're accomplishing. And we see examples of this every single day. We thought they were successful, but it was about what they were doing rather than who they were. Jean-Paul Getty was an amazing businessman. 1957, Fortune magazine describes him as the richest, richest living American. 1966, he's described in the Guinness Book of World Records as the richest private citizen in the world. Multi-billionaire. But he was stingy. He was a miser. If you were over at his house and wanted to use the phone, you could, but it was a pay phone. When his son, Timmy, was growing up, at 12 years old, he, uh, or uh, actually about eight or nine years old, he, it was discovered he had a cancerous brain tumor. And Jean-Paul Getty complained to his wife about hospital bills. And he argued that he was too busy to go visit his son, so for four years, didn't visit his son. When his son, Timmy, died, he didn't even attend the funeral. He said he had too much going on. When his grandson was kidnapped, Jean-Paul Getty spent a long time negotiating the ransom price and the kidnappers were becoming more and more impatient to the point they chopped off the ear of his grandson. Well, he eventually pays the ransom. But then, I kid you not, he charges his son back at a rate of 4% interest. The entire event traumatized his grandson and had lifelong implications. He was married five times. And at the end of his life, he regretted it. He said, man, I'd gladly give up lots of money for a long-lasting marriage. Guys, real success is way more about who we are becoming than what we're accomplishing. And I promise you, the most successful people I know, the names that come to my mind are not people most of you would even know. I don't even, I, I don't even want to put pictures up. But I, but I wrote down some names. I put Titus and Rachel Matthews. That's, those are names that come to my mind when I think success. Scott and Brenda George, Michael and Maria Griffin, Doug and Crystal Bell, Pearl Davidson, her sister Esther, Jim and Cindy Cartmill. Because I could just write a list and you're like, I don't know half these people. Never even heard of them. But they're people who stayed the course. They don't have picture-perfect lives. 
But they faithfully loved and served Jesus, and they loved their spouse, and they have stayed the course in their life. And here's the deal, they don't have perfect marriages. And they don't have perfect families, and not like their kids have made all the decisions that they wish their kids would have made. But for decades, they just kept moving forward, taking lots of little steps in the same direction. And you look at the different aspects of their life, and it's lasting, and it's satisfying, and it's God-honoring. So I'll just close with this. If you say, Dave, I can point to an area in my finances or an area in my career or an area in my relationships or an area in the things that I feed my mind with that I'm on the wrong path, I'm gonna leave you with four words. Here they are, action. You're gonna need to take some action and you're gonna need to do what you need to do to get on the right path. Sacrifice. It's not gonna be easy to get on the right path or to stay on it. It's actually gonna be inconvenient. It's gonna be hard. But if you want to be on the right path, that's what it's going to take. Third word is embarrassing. Because there's going to be people who do not understand it. There's going to be people, as you switch paths, it's not going to make sense. And quite honestly, you may have to do some things that go in opposition to how you've been living in such a way that it's actually embarrassing because now people are mocking you like, oh, so you think you're better than everyone else? Fourth word is relief. Because ultimately, you will find relief. And you will look back at the day or the season or the year you decided to go from the path you were on to a different path, and you will feel relieved that you did not stay on it. So, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for putting inside of us ambition and drive. We, we thank you for putting a hunger inside of us to, to be successful, to make something of our life, to experience what this life has to offer. But Lord, we need wisdom. Wisdom on how to define true success. Wisdom on how to Build a life that is lasting and fulfilling and God-honoring. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for joining us here at Great Lakes Church. Again, my name is Carson, and I'm so glad that you chose to share some time with us this week. We hope something in this talk was meaningful to you, encouraging to you, and maybe even something worth writing down that you can go share with a friend. If you'd like to get involved, maybe join us at one of our physical locations in Southeast Wisconsin, or just be a part of our many other goings on on our social platforms or events in the area, check out greatlakeschurch.com.